Hey everyone, this is Hannah, co-host of Film Roast, where two over-caffeinated and underqualified friends talk about movies, and you're listening to Play Comics Podcast on the Brain Trust Network. <laughs> And welcome to Play Comics, the show where we look at video games based on comic properties and how well they stick to that source material. I'm Chris, and today we have a fan favorite guest returning, my wife Kaylee. Hello! Kaylee, what topic are we looking at today? Because it's one that I don't know at all, and you know a lot better than me. (laughs) We're looking at the Smurfs. I grew up watching the cartoon, but... You apparently didn't because you're a weirdo. It's not that I didn't watch it. It's that I would never choose to watch it. Growing up, if my brother and sister wanted to watch it and I was stuck in the room with them for some reason, yeah, okay, I'll watch it. I didn't hate it, but there are so many things that I just liked a lot better. Well, my brother and I used to watch it all the time. I guess we just didn't have as many other good things to watch as you. Kaylee, why don't you give us a little bit of the comic history of Smurfs? Because I literally know nothing besides that they're little blue people. (laughs) Well, that's pretty much all you need to know, so we're done. (laughs) Okay, that's a good episode. We'll see y'all next time. But really, they are little blue people with white pants and white hats, and apparently they have a tail which I forgot about until I looked them up again for this episode, and they have always had tails. It's just not something I remembered. They are a Franco-Belgian comic, so it's written by a Belgian person. It's, they were originally in French, and they were called Les Strumpf, which sounds more German than French, but that's how it is. They debuted in 1958 as supporting characters in a comic called Johan and Pierre-Louis, whose names were changed to Johan and Piwit when they showed up in the cartoon as supporting characters for the Smurfs. So the Smurfs started as supporting characters for one people. Yeah. And then those people came back as supporting characters for them. Pretty much. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Not at all. And the original story they were in was supposed to be kind of playing off of the Pied Piper of Hamlin. And one of the main characters of that comic had come across a magic flute that I guess enchants anybody who hears it and makes them dance. Originally, the title of that storyline was called The Six Hold Flute. But they eventually changed it to the Six Smurf Flute once they decided what they would call the Smurfs. And the story behind them being called Smurfs was actually kind of funny. The writer was asking somebody to hand him a salt shaker, but he couldn't think of the name. So he just said, hand me the Stroof. And they decided that was a good name for the Smurfs. Since the Smurfs are little people who are little elfy things that live in the forest, they were originally going to be pink and wear flowers for hats, but the writer's wife convinced him to make them blue instead. That's probably a good move. Probably. It means more people would be interested in reading about them and they wouldn't look so girly. It's also kind of funny because most of the Smurfs are boys, so that could have been taken as strange in that era. Well, at some points in history, pink was the boy color and blue was the girl color. So depending on when you want to have the setting, that could have been historically accurate. It was Middle Ages, but also flowers for hats. Yeah, I don't think there's anything you can do about that one. Yeah. After the Smurfs appeared as supporting characters in several comics, they decided to give them their own miniseries. And they had seven different miniseries in the Spirou Journal 
which is a weekly comic collection that came out in Belgium and France. And it had a lot of really popular comic series in it. Eventually, they ended up getting their own stories, period. They turned it into a cartoon series in the 80s with the original writer as the head editor, I believe. He still had a big say in the writing, so it stuck pretty well to the comic properties. There were different types of Smurfs that showed up from time to time. In the original, there were some kind of zombified Smurfs. They called them the Black Smurfs, and they had been stung by some sort of insect that made them go crazy and hop around and try to bite people like zombies trying to eat your brains. But for the U.S., they turned them purple, and that actually made it into the cartoon series as purple Smurfs, definitely not Black Smurfs. So each Smurf has like a little accessory to make them stand out from the other Smurfs because they all pretty much look the same. Papa Smurf has a white beard and he wears red, unlike all the other Smurfs who wear only white. And he was basically the chief of their little village. They all live in little mushroom houses and work together. The other Smurfs all have the white pants and the hat and they all look about the same, but some of them will have... Like Hefty Smurf, who is the main character in the video game, has a little heart tattoo on his shoulder and he's super strong. Brainy Smurf wears glasses because if you're smart, you wear glasses apparently. And then there's Smurfette, who's the only girl I remember, but doing the research, I read that there were at least two other girl Smurfs. But she has long blonde hair and she wears a dress and high heels instead of what the boys wear. And there's just little things like that that'll make them stand out from the other so you can tell which one is which. But mostly they all look the same. Their names are all an adjective that have to do with whatever their special skill is. And they don't have very many enemies. The storylines are all pretty simple. And their main issue is this wizard named Gargamel and his cat Azriel. Gargamel, for some reason, really wants to eat the Smurfs, even though he loves to also say that he hates them. So he's the main antagonist, and they're always trying to escape from him, and he'll capture a Smurf, and they have to go rescue that Smurf, or he comes up with crazy schemes every once in a while, and it the storyline will be all about how they get out of whatever problem he causes. There's not very much difference in the different storylines. They somehow had several hundred, but... Yeah, like, I was looking at it, and it was saying, like, somewhere over 400 different stories, which, I mean, looking at the time frame that it was on, looks like these were, like, 15-minute episodes, kind of, you know, the half cartoon things that were we were used to growing up with Nicktoons. Yeah, and they were kind of generic, so there would be one about how... Jokey Smurf was doing too many practical jokes and everybody was mad at him. And then at the end, he saves everybody with practical jokes. So sometimes it kind of teaches a lesson. And in that case, it doesn't entirely teach the lesson because it kind of unteaches it at the end. But they were all pretty stereotypical little kid shows that may or may not teach you something while trying to be entertaining. So I'm assuming, you know, you'd have your boy who cried wolf storyline somewhere and your ugly duckling storyline somewhere and just all those generic things that you assume are going to show up in a cartoon eventually. Basically, yeah. And one thing that really stands out about the Smurfs is they use the word Smurf for most adjectives and most verbs and pretty much any other time they didn't feel like saying a real word, they would just say Smurf. So I want to smurf your smurf and smurf. What does that mean? Uh, depends on the context. Whatever you happen to see on the screen will tell you whatever they were actually trying to say. Any language experts out there, please let us know if there's another language where it's so context specific like that, because I find linguistical things like that fascinating, as my YouTube history will show you. And Kaylee will also tell you annoys the shit out of her because I tend to watch a lot of those in a row. Oh, yes. And then you fall asleep watching them. That is also true. 
Let's go back to those shoes for a second, because I'm looking at a picture of one of the title cards right now, and I mean, obviously I can't tell what Smurf it is because it's a blue guy with no characteristics, but it looks like they're just wearing the bottom half of footy pajamas. Yeah, that's pretty much what it looks like. Okay, as long as I'm not going crazy, I'm fine with that. Yeah, the only Smurf whose legs you see at all is Smurfette, and that's because she wears a dress. That's so scandalous. It really is. So I've heard a few people talk about Smurfs as a representation of communism with their lack of a traditional currency-based economy and helping each other out all the time. And everybody gets all taken care of and does work specially designed for them in order to help the village. Well, they do. Each Smurf has a particular job and as long as they're doing that job they get everything they need which is kind of the basis for communism but they're also a very small village in the middle of the forest in the middle ages in a tiny town like that people would help each other out and i guess they just didn't need currency they're not dealing with other villages or anything like that there seems to just be the one village of actual smurfs As long as everybody's happy, then I guess they figured they don't need to worry about that. So what it sounds like you're saying is that we're trying too hard to find an analogy here. Yeah, I think so. I can get down with that. This is made for kids. It's not supposed to be all political. That's why so much of it is generic. So is Smurf something that's still going on? Or is it just kind of run its course and left us? It looks like it's still going on. In 1992, the original author died and his son took over, so it's being written by somebody else, but still a relative of the original author. And comics are still a pretty big thing, especially this type of comic in parts of Europe, so I guess there's still people reading them. But they were really, really big in the 70s over there. And then they didn't get big over here until the 80s when we got the cartoon. It seems like this is something that would be easy for kids to jump into because you don't really have the complicated storylines to worry about. You can just kind of grab an issue and wherever you happen to jump on, that's your jumping on point. Yeah, it's such a straightforward thing and it's colorful and cute and really easy to follow. So... Like you said, it would be easy for people to just jump in. The only other thing I really know about from Smurfs was that La 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 song. Yeah, that was the theme song for the cartoon. And I'm looking over here and it's like the opening theme worldwide was called The Smurfy Way. But that La 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 song was season two, only season two in the U.S. And then they used it at the end in the U.S. the whole time. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember hearing a different song for it, but I was also little. I wonder if that's something also where, you know, by the time you would have been watching it, it would have been reruns because spoiler alert, I know how old she is, (laughs) but I'm not telling because I'm not stupid. She would have been watching it in reruns. And I know there are so many shows that I've watched where they take kind of the iconic theme song that everybody loved the best and threw that at the front of the episode, no matter how it actually aired the original way. Which is probably what they did here, because I don't remember it ever having a different one. And out of nine seasons, you would think I would remember the main theme song that they used. Also, there are some crazy names that were in the cartoon. Like, just looking through here, Trace McNeil... That's a name you all should know. Frank Welker had a voice in here. He was the voice of everybody that you love. Mel Blanc. Peter Cullen is our Transformers connection. Well, he's not the only one either. Jim Cummings is also Transformers. And I think I saw Michael Bell. And Frank Welker is Transformers. He's Megatron. I always forget about him being Megatron. He was like the other half of the Transformers from Peter Cullen. He does so many things. I'm sorry, Frank Welker, if you're listening. (laughs) so on that sad note let's drop a promo for another show and then we'll come back and talk about the game which hopefully i won't forget so many things about (laughs) if you like video games debates and silly banter you'll love gamerheads podcast outside of your store because i do feel like your store knows its identity i do i think that you guys know what Uh, you are no not always 
Really? He sells fidget spinners. Well, not anymore. I mean, for a yeah. while. Not Maybe anymore, not, you're Matt. You're experimenting not with Not our... anymore. That's what I'm saying, though. You were just experimenting. <laughs> Golf was made by a Japanese guy. Yeah. Yeah. Go, I wanna. Yeah. Beginning Only the it. game. Yeah, not the okay. sport. Yeah. Okay, I was yeah. like, huh. Well, speaking of Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> Follow Gamerheads on Podbean at gamerheadspodcast.podbean.com. That's a cool show you should definitely go check out. But first, let's finish up with this one. So, Kaylee, again, this is another Game Boy game we're looking at. And I've, I've kind of gotten to the point where I don't want to knock Game Boy games too much because they're on a Game Boy. <laughs> it does make for a shorter game, but I think it works out pretty well. It actually does a decent job of representing the Smurfs, if you ask me. Which surprises the shit out of me because... I was playing that game and I was watching videos of it and nothing screams out Smurfs to me. There's like the first level to me just looks like a generic little village with generic little bugs running around and you're a Smurf. Well, it did give you a little bit of the storyline at the beginning about how Gargamel kidnapped some of the Smurfs. They've already gone missing and he's trying to catch more. So you've got to go and rescue them. I don't remember bugs ever being an issue except for the ones causing the purple Smurfs to become zombified and try to bite everybody. They do show up as one of the bad guys hopping around and trying to attack you. Uh, They might have just added the bugs as another enemy so you didn't have it too easy on the platforming sections. Those purple Smurfs are crazy because being a Game Boy game, they just look like a regular Smurf. So I know the first couple times I played, I'm just running into a Smurf because I think he's my friend. And then you get attacked. But they are hopping around. They are a darker color than the other Smurfs, which is what happened when they got bitten by that bug. And they hurt you. So that's actually pretty much what they're supposed to do. This is my lack of comics knowledge coming to bite me in the butt while playing this game. It's a pretty straightforward game. You get to the end of the level... And you're trying to collect things to get a high score because early 90s is still peak arcade time where you're playing for score. And one of the things you're collecting is leaves, which I looked up just to make sure they look like sarsaparilla leaves, which is what the Smurfs eat in the comics. In the cartoon, they eat Smurf berries, which is supposed to be sarsaparilla berries. But in the comics, they only eat the leaves, which I think is why they included them in the video game. And that makes perfect sense. It's a nice little touch that I never would have caught because I didn't read the comics or watch the cartoon, apparently. (laughs) I've read some of the comics for French classes that I took because the Smurfs are apparently pretty popular in French comics. The levels here do change up a little bit. You don't just always have straightforward platforming levels to get through. There are some minecart type levels whether they be sitting on a log or riding in an actual minecart or a bobsled, where you're going horizontally across the screen, but there's a bunch of enemies and obstacles in your way, and you just have to get to the end. I haven't actually played the game. I did a little bit of the first level a long time ago and was not very good at it at all. But it's not that bad of a game. I know you hate minecart levels, though. I actually kind of enjoy them, but doesn't mean I'm any good at it. Three guesses who does all the minecart levels playing Donkey Kong in our house. (laughs) That's me. So you get through the levels. They're all, you know, act one, act two, whatever act you're on. There's three little bosses in there. One of them is a snake. One of them is a dragon. And one of them is Gargamel himself. The snake kind of comes out, wraps itself around. I can't tell if it's supposed to be pipes or tree limbs or what. And goes after you, and you attack the snake. When you beat him, you get a key, and you get to free your smurf friend. My guess would be those are tree limbs, considering you're supposed to be in a forest in the Middle Ages, so yeah. But to me, they also look striped like candy canes. But it's also the Middle Ages. Pipes weren't a big thing at that point. It could have been anything. The dragon is kind of the same way. I do remember for sure in that one that you are rescuing Jokey Smurf, mostly because the weapons you get to beat the dragon are boxes with bombs in there. So you pick up the box, you throw it at the dragon, it explodes, and then eventually 
the dragon decides that it's not going to fight you anymore. And you jump off his head to free your other smurf friend. And then you go through a few other of the generic levels. If I remember the order right, this is the part where you get to the minecart and then you get to the sled. I have no idea why you have a sled level because these smurfs are running around with no shirts on. So it's got to be warm. And all of a sudden there's snow. To be fair, the Smurfs never wear shirts, ever. And he does wear a scarf in that level. So Smurfs are officially aliens who do not feel the cold, but are somehow pressured into wearing a scarf. It says that they are lutins, which translates to pixie or imp or various things like hobgoblins, depending on which translation you're looking at. And so, yeah, there's some sort of magical forest creature that is usually considered bad, but in this case, they're friendly. And then you get to the last level, and you're going through Gargamel's house. And the thing that surprised me the most was that his cat, Asriel, is following you around, but staying on the ground. And I have cats. If they're going after something like that, they're not staying on the ground. Asriel is not the smartest cat in the world. He kind of runs into things with his head all the time, thanks to the Smurfs, so there might be some brain damage involved. I am sorry for making fun of a concussed cat. That was not very nice of me. It really wasn't. I'm sorry, everybody who has to deal with that. So you get through and eventually, I guess you get out of the house and you fight Gargamel. I don't know why you had to go inside the house to begin with. Probably to look for the missing Smurfs because that's generally where Gargamel tries to cook them in his soup or whatever he happens to be making. So you get out there and there's a seesaw catapult where you launch some either eggs or acorns that a bird is dropping up into Gargamel's face, and eventually, yay, you beat him, and you freeze some Rafet, and that's the end of the game. I'm pretty sure they were acorns. That's what they looked like to me anyway. And that's pretty much a typical way for a Smurf episode to go, was they come up with some crazy plan to get Gargamel to let everybody go or to escape or whatever. So I thought it was pretty fitting. So I'm glad it fit like that. One of the things that really surprised me about this was that Eventually, I realized Europe got a full-fledged NES version of this. Well, they were bigger in Europe than they ever were here. They're still bigger in Europe than they are here, as far as I can tell. I know I learned about the comics for them, because all I knew was the cartoon growing up. I had no idea there were comics until I was in French, and I had a whole chapter in my French book about French comic books. And that was always mentioned in one of those chapters. I mostly just think it's interesting that they took the NES game in Europe and they brought it over here, but they brought it over here onto a different system. Maybe it was cheaper to do on Game Boy or something like that, or they just thought it would sell better that way. Maybe they just really wanted another platformer for the Game Boy. Maybe. I don't know, but there were plenty of games that came out on Game Boy and regular Nintendo, or I had games for Genesis that I wanted to get on Game Boy. So it was a thing that could have happened. I just think it's interesting, that's all. Yeah, my guess is they just didn't think it would be popular enough over here to warrant putting it out on NES and Game Boy at the same time. So they just went with the cheaper option. The only other thing I can think of is that since this game came out for Game Boy in 94, that is pretty much when the NES was on its way out. Um, it's the same year that Wario's Woods came out, which is the last game released for the NES until you got to all these people you know, making games in the last few years. So they probably just saw it as a total waste of time to put it on the NES, even though essentially all you would have to do is convert it from European TVs to American TVs. And actually make the cartridges and stuff, which would have been more expensive if they were about to be done with the system anyway, so. So instead, you throw it on Game Boy. But, I mean, you could have really easily had it on Super Nintendo, too. Who knows? Oh, well. We, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you like this game, never got that chance. Which honestly sucks, because I think having it full color and everything would have made it a whole lot more interesting. Instead, we got the kind of green scale NES version. Yeah, and the Black Smurfs would have stood out as definite bad guys in the NES version. 
Yeah, there's only so much you can do when everything's green scale like that. Um, when your main difference of telling a good guy from a bad guy is color, monochromatic stuff like that is just really not the way to do it. Yeah, but the graphics were actually pretty decent considering it was on Game Boy. The Smurfs definitely look like themselves from the cartoons and from the comics, so I thought that was pretty impressive. This is probably the first Game Boy game we've looked at where it actually looks really good throughout the whole thing. Yeah, I'm honestly impressed with how the graphics turned out despite the monochromatic colors. Especially considering that... They really did just port the European NES game over. There's not much difference there at all. Yeah, we watched playthroughs of both of them, and I didn't really see a difference other than the color. So, I mean, there's a ton of things that the game got right about the comics, despite, you know, me going into this thinking that they were just super generic things that they were throwing into a game. But Kaylee, what could the game have done better? They could have maybe made sure you could tell what the different Smurfs were a little better. The Smurf you're supposed to be has a little tattoo on his arm, and they didn't do that, but that could also just be a system limitation. And it could be a little clearer which Smurfs you're saving at a time, because it's not totally obvious. Like, you could tell Jokey Smurf because of what you were fighting with, but I have no idea who you were saving in the next one. And Smurfette is obviously the last one you save because it shows her kissing you at the end. But as far as I can tell, it followed the stories pretty well. I don't know if they ever actually fought a dragon or a snake in the stories or if they launched acorns at Gargamel using a seesaw type of thing. But they were definitely the types of things you would see in an episode just the way they were fighting and the type of stuff they were going through. So I really don't know what they could have done better, except maybe making the controls a little easier. But again, system limitations. So Yeah, I mean, I would have loved to have seen more Smurfs, even if it was just like when you get to the end of the level, they're standing there ready to cheer you on or something. Because it just seemed like you were the only Smurf there, except for the ones that you were rescuing which in a modern day game would make perfect sense because you could have the game be a lot longer. But considering you're only saving three Smurfs, it just seems a little bit silly that there's nobody else around ever. Yeah, and a lot of times they would work together to rescue their friends too. But that didn't always happen in the comics and the TV show. So I guess it was just easier for them to deal with one and say, that's it, this one is going to save everybody while everyone else sits on their butts back in the village. Because the only other thing I can think of is that, even though it probably wouldn't have made a difference, maybe if you could have chosen which Smurf you were playing as. That could be cool. And since they all have different skills, they could have treated it kind of like the Ninja Turtle games where they had different ways of fighting or whatever. Or dealing with the bad guys, but I think this was just avoid bad guys. And could you even jump on them? Honestly, I don't remember because it's been, it's honestly, it's been so long since I've actually played it. We watched a couple speed runs today to make sure we saw all the levels, and people were finishing this game in under 10 minutes. Absolutely no problem. Which, for a Game Boy game, yeah, that's perfectly fine. So, is this a game that you would recommend to somebody to learn about the Smurfs? I think so. It did such a good job actually sticking with Smurf type stuff, probably because there isn't too much depth you can go into with them. But it did a good enough job of representing what the Smurfs are about. I would still rather read the comics than play the game most of the time as far as learning about them, but I think it would do a decent job. See, I think all of the Smurf connections on this one are so subtle that it wouldn't really be a good thing to show somebody to teach about Smurfs unless they had already read the comics or seen the cartoon a little bit. I'm still going to say the Smurfs have enough generic stuff going on that it would be good enough. You get the setting, you get the main bad guy, your character looks like a generic Smurf. So you get some of the general idea. You can at least know where and kind of when it takes place. 
all of that being said, I'm really surprised with how well this actually ended up sticking to the comic. Because, like I said before, going into this, I thought it was just a bunch of generic levels. But apparently, generic stuff is what the Smurfs are all about. It works. It got them a long-lived TV show. I mean, it was on for almost a decade and then started being reruns pretty much immediately after that, considering how young I was when we were watching it. Kaylee, thanks again for coming on the show. Um, is there anywhere we could find you around on the internet? Uh, Not yet, but we are getting ready to start a podcast with the two of us. Really? Yeah. What is this podcast about? Books you haven't read. Oh, boy. It's kids' books that I have known my whole life in most cases, or I have come to love as a teacher of young children that for some reason Chris has not heard about. And so he is going to get an education. Because apparently I didn't get a good enough one as I was growing up. You are deprived of wonderful, wonderful stories. This is going to be a fun little project. Working title right now, probably what we're going to go with is called Books I Haven't Read. We will eventually tell you where you can find it because right now the only place you can find it is inside of our heads and I'm pretty sure you don't want to go there. <laughs> it's a scary place. That being said, we're going to play a promo for another show and then we will work our way out of here. Once upon a time there was a gnome. Once upon a time there was an elf. Once upon a time there was a little Once upon a time there was a upon a time there was a Once upon a time there was a time there was a time there was a time there was an old rug. Once upon a time 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 and no one lived happily ever after. Fairy tales for unwanted children. Find us on iTunes or at periodically.ca. Thanks again to Kaylee for coming on the show with me again today. It's one where she knew the subject matter a lot better than I did, and I'm perfectly fine with that. If you want to try to be a guest on the show too, then best place to hit me up is probably over on Twitter. You can find me over there at Play Comics Cast. That's all squished together, one word. Thanks again also to Best Day for the use of this amazing music. You can find his stuff over at SoundCloud.com slash best dash day that's best day with a dash in the middle i also thank you to hannah from film roast and the gamer heads and fairy tales for unwanted children podcast they are all amazing things that you should check out this show right here though is a part of the brain trust network you should go check out all the other shows we have on there it's going to be good stuff finally head on over to apple Podcasts, which still sounds weird stitcher whatever you use to listen to podcasts leave us a review or rating or tell a friend but while you're doing that grab a stack of comics grab a game and go find yourself a new favorite character is brought to you in part by the Brain Trust Brothers Network. For more information about this podcast or others, visit braintrustbros.com.